well, and I know it's important for them to be able to kind of stay plugged into the message and that type of thing, so they really enjoy that. So, Okay, look over to Hebrews chapter 13. What we're going to do is we're going to pick back up uh, at our study here at verse 7, 8, 9, along in there. Um, look at verse 7 again. We actually went over verse 7 in some detail last time. We'll review a little bit and then move on. So Hebrews 13 says this, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And like I say, we studied that in great detail last week. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, that is the remnant, that is those that are reading Hebrews and believing what it claims here. It says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, without in the sense of outside, okay? Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, the sense of outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, <coughs> bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Let's uh, let you not our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you again for the time to look into your word today. We thank you for the insight. We thank you for the wisdom. God, we thank you for the, the, the spiritual stability that your word provides and produces in our soul when we approach it by faith, when we believe what you say here. And hence, we truly receive the spiritual life, the power, the strength, the peace that comes from simply believing you and from resting in your word. We thank you for the fellowship around your word that we get to enjoy this morning together. In Christ's precious name, we give these praise. Amen. Amen. A couple of things then to remember by way of uh, just review here. The book of Hebrews, it's about the Hebrews and equipping the Hebrews as they're going to go through the tribulation period. When you're in chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews, of course, the formal presentation of the book of Hebrews has already been completed by this point. In fact, that's, that takes you through chapter 10. Chapter 11, the, the, remember the heroes of the faith? Chapter number 12, he reminds them that they've not come to Sinai. They've come, I mean, they've not come to the mountain that was on fire and so forth. They've come to Mount Zion. Remember that he said, you're not going back. To the old mosaic system, you're not going back to the law. They're right on the threshold of that new Jerusalem and, and the entrance into the new covenant, as it were. So that's chapter 12. And then when you're here in chapter number 13, the writer of Hebrews is giving each and every verse here. It's amazing. He's really it's just a series of exhortations to encourage the Hebrews to, as it were, hold fast the confidence that Christ is their Messiah and he will get them through, okay? How's that for like a minute and a half, two minute review of chapters one through 13, right? Should we have done that three years ago when we started this book? Anyway, all right, so having said that, quickly back to verse seven. This is review. Remember them which have the rule over you. Who was that? That's the 12 apostles. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, that is, the ministry of Peter as the head of the twelve apostles to the nation, whose faith follow. That is, the doctrine that Peter and the other apostles were communicating and conveying to the Hebrews, they need to follow that doctrine. Because if they will follow that doctrine, that is, they'll, they'll walk by faith in that doctrine, Look at what the verse goes on to say. Whose faith follow, considering the end or the goal. Where's that doctrine going to take them? You see the sense in that verse right there? 
He says, whose, uh, he says, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Considering, think about the goal. If, if you think about their doctrine that they're teaching you, that doctrine is going to take you somewhere. Right? That, that's that verse right there. That verse is telling the Hebrews to stick with the doctrine that Christ taught the twelve and then the twelve took and confirmed to the nation. Now that, that's what we looked at last week. So if they'll stick with that doctrine, they'll think through that doctrine, they'll walk by that faith in that doctrine, where is that doctrine ultimately going to take them? Up here on the chart, where's it going to take them? It's going to take them into the kingdom. It'll, it'll successfully take them through. Let me close the chart here. It will successfully take them through the tribulation period. It'll equip them so they reject the temptation to take the mark of the beast. It'll equip them so that when they see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, i.e. Matthew 24, they'll know, you know what? The doctrine told us, then get out of Jerusalem, get out of Judea, flee to the mountains, and so forth. So the faith, that is the doctrine, that the apostles were taught by Christ and that, Christ in, that the apostles in turn confirmed to the nation, that faith will take them to the desired end, that is, into the kingdom. Everybody see that in verse 7 right there? That's the pattern. Okay? Now look at verse 8. And he says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. That's a wonderful verse, by the way. Let me begin looking at that verse by saying a couple of things about that verse in relationship to, unfortunately, how that verse is often used against a dispensational approach to Scripture. So let me back up. When we talk about approaching the Bible dispensationally, what we mean by that is simply this, that God, who does not change in his character, his nature, his integrity. The fact is, he has given different sets of instructions to mankind over time. A, a simple example is this idea, did God ever give instructions about offering blood sacrifices in the Bible. Did God ever do that? I mean, there's, you know, lots of them. Go back to the Old Testament. When dealing with the nation of Israel, he gave them instructions after instruction after instruction about including various animal sacrifices. Now, how many of you offered an animal sacrifice, say, in the last day or so? Or a month? Or shake your head, no, yeah. Bacon, he says, okay, yeah. So, yeah, I know every morning, man, get that bacon out, you know. Well, it's clear then that the instructions that you find in the Bible, that you cannot obey, nor does God require you, nor expect you to obey all the verses in the Bible at the same time. You cannot offer blood sacrifices and not offer blood sacrifices at the same time. It's a simple concept, okay? Let me ask it a different way. When God, in the Bible, when he originally created man, Adam and Eve in the garden, what, what did they eat? Or, or what did they not eat? Let's say it They didn't eat meat. They didn't eat, they didn't eat meat, okay? They basically ate the fruit, the vegetables, things like that, okay? Then after the flood, remember Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Did, was there any modification to the instructions that God gave to man as far as what he could and could not eat? Yeah, they could eat animals at that point. Then fast forward to the nation of Israel when God brought Israel out of Egypt, the book of Leviticus, he made some more modifications to the dietary laws. 
So he restricted even further down what Israel could and could not eat. What are some things that, that say Noah could eat that Israel was not supposed to eat? What, what's it? Shellfish, okay, yeah. I, I just couldn't hear anything else. But shellfish. Do y'all like shrimp? Who likes shrimp here? How about lobster? Things like that. How about crab? Okay. You see, if you were Israel, you, you weren't supposed to eat that stuff, right? You weren't supposed to eat the bacon, <laughs> all right? Okay. But now in the dispensation of grace, you, you can pretty much eat whatever you want to eat. Now, you've heard Brother Jordan say that doesn't mean you should eat anything, right? Okay. But in the dispensation of grace, there are no longer any dietary restrictions. So in the Bible, you can clearly identify at least four entirely different sets of instructions about food from God to mankind. But those differences are not all operational at the same time in history. I say all that to say this, therefore... Studying the Bible dispensationally, dispensation is a great Bible word, by the way. The Apostle Paul uses it several times, okay? But studying the Bible dispensationally is simply the recognition that all the Bible is for us. We can learn from Genesis to Revelation, all the Bible is for us, right? But the fact is it's not all to us, nor is it all about us. We're not the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt wandering through the wilderness, Historically, it's clear that we live on this side of Calvary, not that side of Calvary, right? So studying the Bible dispensationally is the recognition that God has given different sets of instructions to mankind at different times for various reasons. Opposed to that view is the view that comes under the category of what they refer to as covenant theology. Let me say that again, because I know this is new for some of you here. Opposed to the principle of dispensational Bible study is the theological position that's known as covenant theology. And that's the concept that, no, 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 dispensational Bible study is completely wrong that God is always doing the same thing in history, fundamentally, just in veiled or mystery form. That verse right here, Hebrews 13, verse 8, is a common verse that is used by individuals who promote the idea that really God has been doing the same thing all along in history ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. That there really is no difference. They say in that verse right there, since the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, therefore God did not change. That's a classic verse that is used. There's another way that this passage is used also, and that is in really, again, to oppose dispensational Bible teaching, and that is this. That the sign gifts, the speaking in tongues, the healings, the miracles, things like that. Do we, do we hear much about that? That from the epistles of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul made it very clear that the sign gifts were going to pass off the scene of human history once he received the full revelation of the mystery. So once the Apostle Paul had, had written all of his letters, he, he writes them over a good 20 to 30 year period of time, by the way. Okay, so he doesn't, doesn't have all the information all at once. But once he receives the final installment of the revelation of the mystery, then that's historically when the sign gifts passed off the scene. Therefore, if that is the case, and I don't say if in the sense of doubt, I say if in the sense of logic, okay? Therefore, a walk of faith would say that tongues, the healings, all that kind of stuff, that God is not doing that today in the dispensation of grace. 
an opposing view of that will appeal to this verse right here and say, no, 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 no. That verse says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, the sign gifts have to be functioning today. That's the logic that, is, that this verse is used to demonstrate. Everybody understand those two concepts, okay? So, I think we need to ask a different question, and that is, did the writer of Hebrews include that phrase, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever, did he include that phrase in that verse for the purpose of saying, no, no, dispensation of Bible study is completely wrong, throw the chart away. Is that why he wrote that verse? Did, did the writer of the Hebrews include that verse right there for the purpose of commenting any, either way, for or against the idea of the sign gifts? The answer is no, that's not the context of the verse. So it, it seems to me it's completely inconsistent and illegitimate to use that verse as a basis upon which to decide whether or not you should study your Bible dispensationally and whether or not the sign gifts are operational today. That verse has nothing to do with those things. What then does that verse have to do with? The Lord Jesus Christ. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? His what? Someone said it. He hasn't changed. He doesn't change, therefore he is what? He is faithful. That's the point of the verse. The point of the verse has to do with God's intention to complete what he started, to finish what he began, to fulfill his word. And he's going to do it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the point of that statement right there. See, all the way through the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews has been pointing the attention of the Hebrews to this person, the, the son, who is, he's greater than Aaron, greater than Levi, greater than Moses. He's got a priesthood after a completely different order than Levi had, a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. This, the son here, who has got better promises based upon a better covenant, therefore a better hope. And you know who the Son is? His name is Jesus Christ. And since Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, therefore they can have confidence that everything that the writer of Hebrews says about who the Son is, that He is the one that is going to faithfully take them through the tribulation period and into the kingdom. That verse right there is a statement about God's intention in and with and by and through the person of Jesus Christ to fulfill His word. That's what that verse is about right there. Now, before we look at a lot of verses about that, is there an application for us in the dispensation of grace that we can use from that verse right there? Yes. Absolutely. Say yes. yes. Just like God in the prophecy program intends to and will bring to pass everything he promised and he's going to bring it to pass in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, so too in the dispensation of grace. Don't, isn't it reasonable to think and believe that he's going to bring to pass his intention and plan and purpose for the church, the body of Christ, for us today yes. in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, now, having said that then, the context for which he says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever is the issue of God's integrity, his intention to fulfill his word. That's why if you put it back with verse 7... If the Hebrews, if they follow the faith, that doctrine, that Christ taught the twelve and the twelve taught the Hebrews, if they follow that, that will take them to the end, the goal, the intention, the, direct, the kingdom. It'll happen because, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But see that there? Now, let's look at several passages about this idea of the integrity 
of God. And there, I mean, there are hundreds that we could look at. We're not going to look at hundreds, okay? <laughs> we just won't have time this morning. But watch this. Let's look at some verses that, that convey this truth about God's intention to carry through with what he promised he would do. Start with me over in the book of Numbers. Go with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 23. There's some statements here that we want to look at. Numbers chapter 23. Balaam says this. Look at Numbers 23, 19. Watch this. Numbers 23, 19. Watch this. God is not a man. And then look how he identifies what a man is. That he should what? <laughs> you want to know the, the most fundamental difference between God and man? <laughs> God cannot lie and man can and does. Okay? So, anyway, he says this. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. We'll come back to that momentarily. Hath he said... And shall he not do it? See the question there? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? What's, what's in that question? Those two questions. It says, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or, or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? What's in those questions? Yeah, is he a liar? His faith, he's going to do what he said he would do. So right from the beginning back here, God through Balaam here, and this, this guy actually winds up being not such a good prophet, as it were, but he speaks through this man about his own intention with his word. If God said something, what is his intention? To do it. To bring it to pass. Everybody got that concept there? Now, I want to just deposit something in your mind here for a moment, and then we'll come back to it. When it says at verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should what? Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't the book of Genesis say on a couple of occasions that God repented? So now do we have a contradiction? For now, just put that in your mind. We're going to come back to that just in a moment. Does God repent or does he not repent? We're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay? Look at another passage, if you would. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Um, go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, he says this. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You remember the context here. King Saul really rejects the Lord, and so the Lord rejects him in the sense that he's not going to let him be king anymore. Saul objects to that and argues with Samuel. Watch what Samuel says. Look at verse 28. Samuel said unto him, that is to Saul, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also, the strength of Israel, notice it's capital S there, right? It should be capital S, right? That's, that's a reference to their God. The strength of Israel will not do what? Nor repent, for he is not a man that he should what? Now, what's... Samuel's point in saying this about God to King Saul. He's not going to change his mind about what? About God's choice and decision for Saul to no longer be king. Okay? So you understand. 
that when the Bible says sometimes that God repented, but other times it says God repents not, is that a contradiction? It, it can't be a contradiction, but what's the question that we should ask? Whenever you, whenever you see what appears to be a contradiction in your Bible, should you just throw your hands up and say, oh, you see, you can't believe the Bible, it always contradicts itself, what should you do? Context, context. Ask, okay, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? In both contexts, the context of Numbers 23 and the context of 1 Samuel 15, God has made a statement about his intention to do something. In the case of Numbers 23, his intention with regard to the eventual outcome of the nation of Israel. In 1 Samuel 15, his intention to remove Saul from being king. And he was not going to change his mind about his intention. What he declared. Go back with me now, if you would, to Genesis chapter 6. Quickly, Genesis chapter 6. Go to Genesis chapter 6. This is a classic passage where it says... God did repent. Go to chapter number 6 here. Look at chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 5. And God saw, Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his, tar- of his heart was only evil continually. By the way, ne- next time you read the news and read the paper. And it's getting bad out there, by the way. It is. But it's not as bad as right there. Right? Watch verse 6 now. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. 7. The Lord said, I will destroy man among whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made man. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we just saw some verses that said, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a man that he would repent, and yet that verse clearly says he repented. So did he or didn't he? Yes. But is it a contradiction? How could this not be a contradiction? Context, 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 right? The other passage is the one, for example, they're not the only two, by the way, the one in Numbers 23 and 1 Samuel 15 where it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor, nor a man that he should repent. It's a specific context in which God made a promise. He says, I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to change my mind about my intention to fulfill this. When the Bible does say that he did repent, it's in a context like this, where what he does is he makes a choice to do something different totally independent of any promise he made, in this context, by the way, to man. Okay? So you understand it's not at all a contradiction, but you do need to read the context and make sure that uh, um, you let the context help us understand why it's not a contradiction there. Okay? The reason we went to those verses, the one in Numbers and the one in 1 Samuel, that question, hath he spoken and shall he not do it? Hath he said, and shall he not bring it to pass? What's the question and what's the answer? What are those questions there? God said something. What's his intention? He's going to bring it to pass. When the writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever, who is Jesus Christ? Who is, who is Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, verse 1? He's the Word, capital W-O-R-D. Jesus Christ is the member of the Godhead who is the spokesman for the Godhead. He's the Word. When you couple that back together with, with the question, hath he spoken and shall he not do it? Who was the one that said it? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Hebrews makes that connection with Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the member of the Godhead, speaking on behalf of the Godhead, who places the integrity of the Godhead on the line by when he speaks. 
That's why Hebrews says. It's, he, he doesn't say God the Father, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, that, that, that'd be a true statement as well. Neither does he say God the Holy Spirit, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That would be a true statement as well. But it's Jesus Christ. Because he's the Word. He's the Messiah. He's the person that the book of Hebrews is really focusing on. And they can trust Jesus Christ to take them through and into the kingdom. Let's do this then. Look at another couple of passages where the same principle is clearly taught. Go to James chapter 1, and then we're going to look at Psalms 132. Go to James chapter number 1 here. This is very interesting. Once again, about the integrity of God. In this case, he does reference the Father. Look at James chapter number 1, verse 17. James 1.17 says this. James 1.17, it says this. James 1.17, he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. By, by the way, that is not a reference when you go buy your lottery ticket and you won. That's not, that's not what that verse is talking about, okay? The, the good gift and that perfect gift for them, that's, that's the kingdom. It's when, the, when that new Jerusalem comes down, he brings in the, the city, the kingdom, the new covenant, and all the blessings and so forth, all right? So, um, anyway, it says, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Watch this. And come down, cometh down from the Father of lights, here's the phrase, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What do those phrases mean? There's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What, what does that mean about God? He's not going to change his character, his nature. He's going to do what he says. He's going to fulfill his word. Go ahead. Uh, loud, please. I'm sorry. And, and, and he's, I, I still couldn't hear. I'm so sorry. The air conditioner. Oh, he's not. Oh, that's just good. She, she, said, she said he's not moody about it. Right? That's really good. That is so good. That would be a problem, right? You know, if God was really having a really, a really bad hair day, which he doesn't, by the way, but, you know, if, if he went to the beautician and the beautician did a really bad job or gave him a bad haircut and so forth, then God's, you know, really moody. I, I don't, no, no, that, that's, there, there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Therefore, since that's true about God, we can trust him. He's, what's that? He's great. That's a great song. Great is thy faithfulness. And that's true from Genesis to Revelation. That's true in any dispensation that we can trust God for what he says he's going to do. By the way, that's one huge reason why it's so important to know your Bible. So that you can be sure that what you are trusting about God is what he said he's going to do. A lot of people believe things about God that God never made any comment about himself. Think of the various phrases that people say about God. Things like this. That, well, God helps those that help themselves. What, what verse of scripture is that in again, by the way? That, he does say that. Interesting. But there's a, lot, there's a lot of statements that people say about God. They say, oh, God works in mysterious ways. Well, what verse is that again? I, I, anyway, there, there's just a lot of phrases that people throw out there in Christianity that frankly are no help. They're, they're, they're no help. I know, you know, for the most part, people mean them for good and they, they want to help. And sometimes people say things because they, they don't really know what to say. So they just pass, pass on the same Christian jargon that... that it doesn't really help. It doesn't really say anything. And, and like lemmings, we, we shake our head. Oh, yeah, yeah. God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, yeah. You know? But whatever it is that we believe about God, we need to make sure that we got that from the Word of God in its context. That's so vital. Okay? Now, let's do this. Go with me, if you would, to Psalms 132. Go with me to Psalms 132. Psalms 132. 
Think about that statement, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a wonderful statement, and it's wonderful because it's true. He's trustworthy. He's going to do what he says. They can believe him as their Messiah to get, him through, to get them through. Why is that statement in the book of Hebrews? How come, for example, it's not in Romans, for example? How come it's not, say, in Philemon, for example? How come it's in Hebrews? Well, watch this. Watch this. We're going to go down and we're going to read this psalm here. Psalms 132. It's 18 verses. We won't read all of it. Um, we just don't have enough time, right? But watch this. He says, Psalms 132, verse 1. Everybody got there? It says, Lord, remember who and all his afflictions. Who was David? King David. So who was David? What's that? A man after God's own heart. What did that mean? He wanted the things that God wanted. What did God want? He wanted to bring his city, Jerusalem, to, to this earth. He wants to establish the kingdom that he promised to the nation of Israel, to this planet. The literal, physical establishment of the kingdom to this earth. That's what God's heart was about. David believed that. When the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart, David wanted what God wanted. That, that's the context of David being a man after God's own heart. Okay. Remember, God made a promise to King David, known as the Davidic... Actually, he made a number of promises to King David, but... But the big one, which, which is the umbrella for all the others, really is called the Davidic Covenant. And he promised to David that from David's seed line, the Messiah would come forth who would be king over all the earth forever. He would be David's son in the sense of David's heir through David's lineage. But he also would be God's son. Think about that. If he's going to be David's son, that means he has to come through human flesh, David's seed line. There's his humanity. But if he's going to be God's son, then he's going to be God's son. There's his deity. The wonderful thing about, one of the many wonderful things about the Davidic covenant is he was going to be both man and God. When Isaiah 9 says it this way, it says, Unto us a child is born, there's his humanity. Unto us a son is given, there's his deity. Both in the same person of Jesus Christ. When the psalmist here is saying, Lord, remember David. Well, does that imply that God is somehow going to get Alzheimer's in his old age? No, 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 no. Can God, can God ever forget anything? Does he? Okay, so why tell God to remember something? What's going on here? What? The, the, the sense is, Lord, you made a promise. We're holding you to it. Which, that honors God, by the way. When he says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob, surely... I will, here's what David said to God. Surely I will not come into my, the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. That, those verses describe what was in David's, David's heart and therefore why David was a man after God's own heart. When David went in and was finally established as king over, both, uh, over all Israel and Judah, the whole kingdom and so forth, and he built his own house, he said, he said, you know what? I built my house, but I need to find the dwelling place for God to come and go on this earth. I want to build him a house. And that was his intention. And that's the setting in which God, through the prophet, said to David, David, I'm going to build a house through your seed line. So when you're back at verse 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, that tells you 
what David's, what was in his heart at the time God made the promise to him about the kingdom. Now watch verse 6. He says, Lo, we have heard of it at Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the wood. It is the location, basically, where God was going to dwell. We will go up, we will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. That's, that's their goal. So watch verse 8. Arise, O Lord, into thy what? Thou and the ark of thy strength. See, that, that, that's David leading his people in praise of Almighty God, at finding the place where God's going to dwell, and then, and then beseeching God to arise from heaven, as it were, and come and dwell with them on the earth, in the land, in the temple he's going to build. Verse 6, Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. That's a picture of the kingdom right there, what it's going to be like when he establishes this thing, the kingdom. Now watch, watch what happens now. For thy, servants, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Now watch him remind God about the promise. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not what? In our context, to turn from it would mean what? Change his mind? Abandon it? Give up on it? Not bring it to pass. Right? When that verse says he will not turn from it, it's because... He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He intends to fulfill what he said. And the context here is about what he said to David, the Davidic covenant, the establishment of that literal physical kingdom on this earth. Verse 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Here's what he said. Of the fruit of thy body, David's body, will, what's the next word. Who's the I? That's, who, that's the Lord in verse 11 there. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. But you got to, I'll tell you what, the, the first time I really saw that verse, see, see, we tend to read that verse this way. We tend to read it where, where God says to David, David, of the fruit of your body will I set someone else on the throne. But that isn't what that verse says right there. That verse says, David, of the fruit of thy body, I'm going to sit on the throne. Do you see the verse? There's his humanity and his deity again. Of the fruit of thy body, David's body, there's his humanity. Well, I, there's the, there's the member of the Godhead who speaks the word, who becomes flesh, and it sits on David's throne. There is his deity and his humanity right there in that verse. Isn't that something? His promise to David is, David, I promised you that from your seed line, I am going to enter into humanity, and I'm going to sit on the throne of that very tabernacle and that, that very kingdom, the land that you and your heart sought for me to dwell in. Isn't that wonderful? So by the book of Hebrews saying, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you see the connection here? It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Lord in that verse who said to David, David, of the fruit of your body, I'm going to sit on the throne. And because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he will what? Do it. Hath he spoken, and shall he not bring it to pass? Hath he said, and shall he not do it? You see the principle there? So all the way through the book of Hebrews, he, the writer of Hebrews keeps saying, he's their Lord. He's the Messiah. Trust him. He will take you through. Because... He's trustworthy. 
Now go back with me, if you would, to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And let's, let's ask it this way. That, that clock always moves way too fast, does it not? Let's ask it this way. You always first want to read a passage in its context and interpret it in its context and appreciate it that way. And then you ask the question as well, having understood it in its context, is there something that we can apply in our dispensation and our lives? And if so, what would that be? Any thoughts, any ideas? Okay, okay. Paul, what would you say? Say it loud, please. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of what? Promise. Promise. So since God said it, shall he not do it? Go ahead. The redemption of the purchased possession. possession. He purchased the possession. Is he going to abandon it at the end? Is he not going to come and, and redeem and set free that which he purchased? What would another application be similar along these types of things we're complete in him isn't that something what else the apostle paul so many times he says god is what faithful in fact let's look at that verse here go to go to first corinthians chapter one watch this now first corinthians chapter number one go to first corinthians and chapter number one 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, watch this. I, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to start at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 says this. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, are you? Yes. You're waiting for the rapture, right? Good. Now watch what he says. Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, Next three words. See that? God is faithful. By whom ye were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Question. Who called us into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord? Who called us into that? God did. So, since He's faithful,